um, and then worked on plantations with no freedom. These West African slaves, perhaps up to 30% of them had been Muslim. So there were Muslims in America well before the 20th century, but they were hardly citizens. Most of them, in fact, were slaves. But the remnant Muslim practices that, that they brought with them endured, and I think what we call African-American Islam today reflects those early and very horrific origins of West African Muslim slaves before 1860 or before the American Civil War. So let me just give you three dates. <clears throat> For people who came from the Mediterranean, they're often called the Levant or Levantine Muslims, that is, people who came from Lebanon or from Jordan or from Palestine or Egypt. Those people who came to the United States early 20th century were mostly of Arab origin. But then in the 1920s, there developed something called the Black Nationalist Movement. And even though in some ways it was not about Islam, it was labeled Islam. It was called the nation, eventually became called the Nation of Islam. Um, it had Elijah Muhammad, uh, and then uh, many people have heard of Malcolm X, uh, and then of course Louis Farrakhan, uh, and then W.D. Muhammad were all associated with either the early or later period of what became known as the Black Nationalist Movement, the Nation of Islam, and its successors. But beyond Arab immigrants, and beyond African-American movements, 1965, which is barely 50 years ago, it's hard to, for most people to remember this, but barely 15 years ago, there were very few Muslims, especially from South Asia, in the United States. But at the height of the Vietnam War, you remember America has often been at war, it was the Vietnam War in 1965, and President Lyndon Johnson, who had succeeded President Kennedy, whom you may recall was assassinated in 1963, President Johnson pushed very hard to have a change in immigration that reversed the rejection, stopped the uh, um, prohibition of immigrants in 1920s. He reversed it in 1965. And so from 1965 until today, till 2014, there's been a huge increase of Arab, but also South Asian immigrants, many of whom are Muslim, into the United States. So great has been this increase that by the early 1970s, that, it would, that is within five to 10 years of the passing of this law, the majority of Muslims in America were no longer from the African American community, but were first or second generation immigrants, more of them from South Asia than from the Levantine Arab communities. In other words, before 1965, there had been a lot of immigrants, but they were mostly Arab from beyond the United States. But after 65, there were some Arabs, and I'll talk about them in a moment. But the majority, or the largest number of the immigrants, have been immigrants who've come from South Asia. And that, of course, is India principally, but also Pakistan, Bangladesh, and even a few from Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. But the, but the study of Islam, those who work on it, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, uh, they have been very slow to pick up on the fact that the division between immigrant and indigenous, between Arab, Asian, and African-American Muslims is in some sense artificial because they all belong to a movement that is shaped by the ethos of Islam, even if they have a different view and a different practice of Islam. But because African-Americans are seen, first of all, as African-American, there is in the American Academy something that's called it used to be called Black Studies, now it's called African American Studies, and it relates to America and American religions and very little to Islam. But the study of immigrant Muslim communities, those who are Arab and Asian, and some who are African but not African American, distinguishing the new from the old immigrants, these kinds of studies are carried out in a field called history or comparative religion or Islamic studies. I think it's important to know that that's an artificial distinction and it needs to be challenged and changed. So the first suggestion I would have about the presence of Muslims and Islam in American history is to challenge the claim that the only form of authentic Islam comes from the Hejaz or more generally from Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula. One of the challenges for me but also for most of my colleagues and most of my friends who teach in the United States, 
is when we start a class and we say, where is the center? Where is the geographic center of population in the Muslim world? And almost all of our students will say either Cairo or they will say Riyadh or they will say Baghdad. But in truth, the cap could either be could either be Karachi or Delhi. In other words, the majority of Muslims in the world, if we think of the whole world, over 1 billion, and some people say as many as 1.5 billion Muslims, the center, the center not geographically, but, but demographically, in terms of the number of people, is not in Arabia, but in Asia. Not in Saudi Arabia, but in South Asia, either in Karachi or Delhi. And that's a very important thing to remember. And African American Muslims, even though they did not immigrate to the states they were forcibly brought over as slaves and now for, uh, are living a, a new life uh, since the uh, changes after the Civil War. These immigrants uh, and those who are other Muslims uh, should be studied together. Secondly, what's really important, and most people, even I suspect many in this audience, do, do not rec recognize that it isn't just others who are studying Muslim. There have been Muslim institutions started by Muslims from the 1970s and 1980s. So one of the newest developments, and I think most important developments, is that these are new institutions, educational institutions, social institutions, various kind of professional networks, all begun by Muslims, many of them immigrant Muslims, and they have, they have done a number of things, but the first thing that they've had to do, especially since 9-11, is to respond to that event. And I could spend the rest of this lecture I've been allotted 40 minutes, and I told myself I would not go over 35 so we could have time for question and answer. But I could devote the entire rest of this lecture talking about the hostile reaction, first to Islam, but also to Muslims, that followed 9-11, the 11 September 2001 attacks. Uh, but I prefer not to do that because it's a very negative. You may have already heard too much or all you want to know, certainly, about it. And that would lead me away from something that I think is much more important for you, and I think also for Islam in America, and that is how the presence of immigrant Muslims has changed American life for the better. This is not the, the central view, this is not the view you see in the media, it's not the view perhaps of even many politicians, but it's the view that I have and it's shared by many of my colleagues and also by some of my fellow citizens. So here are the challenges. The first is to think about immigrants in terms of networks and how these networks have developed since 1965. So instead of talking um, about the Levantine or Eastern Mediterranean or talking about those from Africa or Southeast Asia, let me just focus on South Asian Muslims because I think that would be most interesting to you today. So what has happened to South Asian Muslims in America since 1965, that is during roughly the last 50 years um, since the passage of this law that permitted immigrants from South Asia to come to the United States and to become green card and then eventually citizens. First thing to note is that most of those who are South Asian Muslims, even though there are Afghan taxi drivers in much, many parts of Chicago and New York and also Washington DC, despite the image of the Afghan taxi driver, most Muslim immigrants are well-educated professionals that belong either to um, teaching or medical or business or engineering communities. They constitute a third major group of American Muslims. So I've mentioned the African Americans are the first. Anytime you want to think of Muslims in America, the very first group is African American slaves who later became free, but they are the original American Muslims. It's often difficult for people to remember that, but it must be remembered. Then there are Arab American Muslims who came over in the 1920s and some of them in the 30s, but the immigration laws slowed up that, made it very difficult until 65, when suddenly there were many more Arabs and many, many more South Asian Muslims who came to America. So when I was thinking about this talk, I tried to troll various sites and I asked different people and the answer I got was, it's roughly the same, but African-American Muslims are the largest. They're maybe about 35%. Arab Muslim Americans are maybe 
and South Asians are just behind them at 29%. So there's rough parity. I would say, first of all, all these are conjectures. The reason I can't say it's exactly this or exactly because the census figures in America do not have religion. They do not count people by religion. So what one does is take an estimate of families and groups and traditions and to be able to project from those. To, so there are widely varying. If you looked in a, if you just went online and you said, oh, I want to find out how, whether Professor Lawrence is right or wrong, you will find online variation in the size of the Muslim community of America, something between as low, as low as 4 million and as high as 12 million. So it ranges, it changes from 4 million as the low end. So I, I go in the middle. Whenever I have something that's that complicated, I go in the middle and say roughly 8 million. Of those 8 million, there are also some I have not included who are Turkish and Iranian because many of the Turkish and nearly all the Iranian are secular Americans. Even though they come from majority Muslim countries, they do not practice Islam and do not often self-identify as Muslim. So I don't think it's correct to say, oh, because they're Turkish or they're Iranian and there are so many of them, let's throw them into the pot. And so instead of 8 million, we have 9 million Muslims in America. And of course, also, there are some who are Arab and come from India and Pakistan who may have been Muslim, but no longer consider themselves Muslim. And again, it's very tricky on how you count them. But I still think I'll stick with 8 million, not 9 million, and say it's roughly African American is the highest number, then Arab, and South Asian not far behind. So what are the networks? Some of these are very familiar to you. They are distinct, exclusive clubs. They can also be voluntary associations for graduate, uh, graduates of particular schools, universities that are predominantly Muslim. Or they can be political parties that are based overseas but have networks in the United States. And of course, there are also Sufi or sectarian movements. I'm thinking, of course, here, uh, not only uh, of the larger Naqshbandi community, but also the Ahmadis, who are counted, by the way. In, in the Muslim, um, in the census taking, in Southern America, the Ahmadis are also counted as Muslim. And that might be a controversial issue for some uh, in this room, but that's the way it's done in America. So in the alumni category, be no surprise, you find something like the old boys and girls of India. And that's the Aligarh Muslim University. There is an old boys, I've actually been to a couple of these meetings, old boys and girls, I'm a kind of honorary old boy, I guess. Um, old boys and girls of India from Aligarh. There's also its equivalent from Pakistan, the Karachi University, old boys and girls uh, club. Then there are networks. Um, I've been, because I spent time in Yemen, to the Yemeni students, but there's almost nothing about Islam there. I mean, these people are all Muslim. They're all Muslim students. Some of them are Muslim adults that identify with the Yemeni Student Association, but there's very little Islam there. So it's, it's, it's extraordinary how diverse different immigrant groups are. And it's not a division between Christian and Muslim or different kinds of Muslim. It's often a division between those that practice any form of religion and those who are secular. And you might be pleased to know there's also Hyderabad associations. In fact, there is a medical group up in West Virginia that I visited a month ago, yeah, just a month ago, of Hyderabadi doctors in West Virginia. And I said, why do you want me to come up there? They said, well, because we hear you're going to India and you should remember us when you get there. So greetings from West Virginia, from the Hyderabad Medical Association of Western Virginia. And then there are groups for Palestinians, like the Bintahanina Social Club, that showcase language and culture. And again, some of these I would call Muslim, but not explicitly Islamic. They have a lot of accent on literature and um, political events, but Islam, per se, does not come very high. Um, and then there are, and this is more important, I think, uh, when you understand Islam in America, there are Islamic schools. So up to now, I've been talking about associations, some of them student associations, but I have not been talking about schools. There also are in America, and this again, only has happened since 1965 and would not have happened without the 1965 Immigration Act. There are Islamic schools uh, where the faculty, the subjects, and all the students, or almost all the students, are Muslim. This may surprise you, but some of them were started by the Nation of Islam, even when it was under Elijah Muhammad and before it became more closely identified with uh, Sunni Islam worldwide, even it started to have schools that only catered to its own clientele, and they were usually African American, although now they've also broadened out and include Asian, Arab Americans, and also even some non-Muslims. But then there are schools 
that are established by middle upper class immigrant Muslims, especially around Chicago, but also New York and DC and Atlanta. Uh, one of my students, a um, uh, uh, young African American Muslim student, Jamila Karim, had did, a, did a study of mosques in both Chicago, immigrant mosques in both Chicago and Atlanta, which is her hometown, she's African American, to determine what are the social relations between South Asian and African American Muslims. And it was a pioneering study and since been made into a book that's won a couple of awards. So there are these kinds of associations that go through schools where, and mosques and classes at mosques and full-time Islamic schools that have only begun since 1965. Probably the best known and certainly the most controversial of all the Islam or Islamic school standalone institutions in America is something called the International Institute of Islamic Thought. Often people refer to it in abbreviation as the triple IT, International Institute of Islamic Thought. It was founded in 1981 in Virginia, right outside Washington DC in Herndon, Virginia. It has offices and branches. Um, I've not seen any or heard of any in India, but I know I, I've actually been to one in Bangladesh and there's also supposed to be one in Pakistan and in the United Kingdom, I've seen it in the United Kingdom. Um, and a Nigerian friend whom I met in Turkey last month said there's also one in Lagos. So this is, this is branch in America, but also has um, other outlets elsewhere. And it has a project which some of you may have heard of called Islamization of Knowledge. And this project, Islamization of Knowledge, is to reform all school curricula, at least all those with majority Muslim students, and to have Islamic thought applied to global problems. So it has, um, is, Islamic economics is the best known form of it, but it also has Islamic housing, it has uh, Islamic uh, politics, it has uh, Islamic education, it has a whole range, Islamic health service, everything that can be talked about is talked about as Islamization of knowledge. In the 1990s, this triple IT established what it called the Graduate School of Islamic Social Sciences, the effort is to train imams and Muslim chaplains, especially in the military and in prisons. And this continued until it was after, after 2001, after 11 September. I think the most important group that has come up in America, um, especially one that trains Muslim chaplains, is at Hartford Seminary. Hartford Seminary is in Hartford, Connecticut. And in 2004, that is 10 years ago, they started a program for training Muslim chaplains in the United States. They have graduated now, as of 2014, over 25 people. And I should add that 20 years ago, there were maybe one or two Muslim chaplains in America. Today, there are over 30. So again, as in the increase of classes or courses or professors who teach Islam, there's also been a huge increase in Muslim chaplains and Muslim chaplains in America. And I'm proud to say that I was able to argue for having one at Duke. Um, unfortunately, he didn't come from South Asia, but he's a very nice Turkish fellow, uh, Imam Abdullah Antepli. He comes from Southern Turkey. Um, he speaks English better than I do. Um, and he has a wonderful knack of being funny, he, he once uh, introduced uh, me to a group of people. He said, I know, he calls me Professor Bruce. I know Professor Bruce, I'm his Turkish delight. Of course, Turkish delight is a candy. But I don't quite think of him as a candy, but he certainly is a Turkish delight in every other sense. And the, I want to close by accenting something else that is very distinctive to Muslim immigrant life in America. There are many Muslim women. Muslim women are very active as leaders. There are African American women, uh, let me make, uh, not, not, not forget to acknowledge that there are also African-American Muslim women who are very prominent. Amina Wadud is the most prominent and controversial of all of them. But there are also many Muslim women who have been immigrants who now become leaders and activists. Um, they assume major roles. Uh, Amina Chowdhury uh, recently, studied, recently started uh, a monthly Islamic journal uh, published from Cambridge, Massachusetts. She's a PhD at Harvard. Uh, that has become very influential. There's something called Islamic Horizons, uh, which mostly focuses on women. It's Journal of the Islamic Society of North America. Um, it, in fact, 
uh, helped nurture something called the MSA, Muslim Students Association. Obviously, it serves men as well as women, but the women have been very active in it. So active that in 2007, that is only seven years ago, when they had a poll as to who would be the president of the MSA in America, Muslim women not only got the president, the vice president, they even got the treasury. So there's a sense in which Muslim women have been very active in university and life. And in ISNA, ISNA means Islamic Studies of North America. It's a very mainstream group. It's the largest umbrella Islamic group in North America. Uh, it's been around for almost 25 years. But in 2006, 2006, uh, I'm almost done now. You can all hear me. Uh, in 2006, it also elected a woman, in fact, a woman who was not from either Africa or Asia or uh, was an African-American, but somebody who was a, a Swedish-American, Ingrid Mattson. Uh, despite her name, she's very Muslim, uh, been a practicing Muslim for over 20 years. And in 2006, Dr. Ingrid Mattson was the first woman, first Muslim and first woman to be elected head of ISNA, um, the Islamic Studies in North America. And let me close by mentioning one other group uh, that you may not have heard of that's very, very much um, a part of immigrant Muslim life in America. It's called the Progressive Muslim Union. The abbreviation is PMU. Again, it came up in the recent period. It didn't start until 2004. If you want to see more about it, then I can tell you in a few minutes. You can look up the website, which is Muslim Wake Up. You can't forget that, Muslim Wake Up. Uh, it should be capital M-W-U, but if you just write all small letters, muslimwakeup.com, you'll still come up with a website, since the web is neutral about capital letters. So this website, muslimwakeup.com, reflects young, mostly academic reformers and their view of Islam. Uh, some of them are opposed to ISNA, that is the general group I mentioned, the Islamic Studies in North America. They're very um, brave, bold, uh, sometimes outrageous to other people in the kind of issues that they take on. Uh, they've had very important leaders, um, at least one of whom you may have heard of, actually he's from India and, and from Hyderabad, Muqtadar Khan, who happens to be um, a, a, also a Muslim chaplain and a friend of mine. Uh, and one of them also is a former student of mine. Um, I've had many former Muslim students, and one is Umid Safi.